Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Android App Arena is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Android App Arena, episode three for Friday, June twenty seventh, two thousand fourteen. Away from home. This episode of Android App Arena is brought to you by lynda.com. Learn what you want, when you want, with access to over 2,400 high-quality online courses, all for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit lynda.com slash arena. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash arena. Hello and welcome to another episode of Android App Arena. It's good to have you on board the OSS Android. I'm your captain, Jason Howell, and today I'll be showcasing a bunch of apps that I think are install worthy. They would be on this show if I thought any different. But being away on vacation for the week put me in somewhat of a predicament. After all, vacation is usually time away from work, and when running apps on my device is part of my job, I found myself only using my device for a select few things. It's how I truly get away when I'm away. So I kept tabs on a few apps that I found myself using on vacation, and actually, though they may not be the newest apps in the world, there's some great apps that got a lot of use this past week. So let's take a look at a hodgepodge of apps from my trip. Now, first up is an app that I've had installed for a few years now, and when I go away, it literally gets used every single night. It's called simply White Noise, and it's developed by TMSoft with a free version as well as a paid version for $1.99 that gives you more sounds. Now, sure, you could just download a White Noise MP3 file onto your device and play it looped all night, and believe me, I've done that too, but this app is so good because it gives you a bunch of other noises to play around with that you never thought might do the trick. For example, turns out that White Noise isn't nearly as soothing to my ears as Brown Noise. There's also an assortment of water sounds like heavy rain, or even sprinkler. There's a Tibetan bowl, train tracks, an air conditioner. I mean, come on, there's even kittens purring for Pete's sake. And if cats won't sell you on it, I just don't know if there's any hope for you anymore. There's timer functionality that allows you to set up your own scenarios, be it to determine when the sound should shut off or even when it should start playing, like an alarm though I'd guess that using sounds that put people to sleep as your alarm clock is probably asking for trouble, but there you go. You can create playlists of your favorite sounds, or even better, you can create mixes of sounds, meaning if the sound of the Amazon and kittens purring at the same time is your bag, just mix it up, complete with volume, pan, and pitch controls for each individual sound in your mix. And finally, if the more than 40 stock sounds doesn't do it for you, let's say what really gets you sawn logs is the sound of, oh, I don't know, World Cup soccer. They have an integrated website where you can download and add new sounds for free and more added every month. And to that, all I really have to say is... <laughs> Now, one day on my vacation, my brother-in-law invited me along on a road trip from Atlanta to a night on the town in Nashville, Tennessee. Of course, I took him up on it, especially when he showed me the fire red Ford Mustang that he rented just for the trip. But eventually, a problem emerged. What do we do? Where do we go? And for me, the solution was a combination of my old reliable Yelp app and the app I'm going to show off today, Jelly. You may have heard of Jelly months ago, and I'll be honest, when I first heard about the service, I thought it was an interesting idea that I'd likely rarely use. But guess what? It comes in incredibly handy in situations like this. So what is Jelly? The social service created by Twitter co-founder Biz Stone is a way to ask questions to your broader social network. So when you launch the app for the first time, you're asked to connect it with your Twitter and or your Facebook accounts. Jelly doesn't post on your behalf. What it does is link you through its service with not only your immediate connections, but also friends of your friends. So when it comes time to pose your question, it reaches a number of people connected to you in some way, not just a bunch of random souls. The hope is that by posing your questions to folks you're connected with in some way, you'll actually get thoughtful and helpful answers. It manages all of this through the Jelly app, 
and I quite like its graphical approach. Large cards appear in front of you with a question posted by one of your connections. If you think you have a good answer, click the answer button and fire away. The recipient will get a notification on their device, and yes, it's cross-platform, so iOS users get in on the fun too. If you like the question, tap good, and more people will see it, hopefully have an answer to extend. You can take a look at all the answers by swiping up from the bottom tab. That tells you just how many answers have been given so far. If you don't want to look at the question anymore, simply swipe the card down to move on to the next one. Now, the question I posed was simple. In downtown Nashville for the night, first time, what on earth should I do eat see? And while I only got five answers, I was able to determine that Broadway was the place to be, and really, our hotel was a few blocks away, so that was nice to hear. Also, got a few recommendations on places to eat and check out the music scene. Oh, and if someone gives you an incredibly helpful answer, don't forget to click the thanks button so they know you care. It's this personalized approach that makes this a powerful tool when you're visiting a place you've never been before. Oh, and it's also really handy for other kinds of questions, too, like determining what it means when a recipe says two shallots. 43 answers. You people obviously care about shallots. That's jelly, and it's free. So you remember that fire red Ford Mustang? Well, what if I told you that on our way back to Atlanta the next day, we found ourselves smack dab in the middle of a high-speed police chase? And no, I'm not even kidding. We weren't necessarily the persons of interest, thankfully, but we were surrounded by mobs of police cars, talking 20, 30 police cars whizzing past us in hot pursuit of a black Dodge Charger that nearly upended us from behind not one but two times as it rushed by at least around 100 miles per hour on a crowded highway. Yeah, it was pretty intense. In the middle of all the chaos, my brother-in-law asked me if there was an app that might help us determine what was happening up ahead so we could make sure to be prepared for any traffic stops as a result. And immediately, I turned to Waze. Now, here's the thing about Waze. There's a lot to take in. And admittedly, I used a small part of the app that day. So let's start there. Waze is a social maps and navigation app. The whole purpose of Waze is to allow you and other users to self-report road conditions to make driving from point A to point B faster and safer. So in my case, when I logged in, I was able to monitor the road ahead of us on the freeway and see if and when a fellow Wazer reported either a traffic stop or an accident, which we thought was the inevitable outcome of the police chase. Thankfully, uh, we didn't see that uh, and be prepared for it. Waze takes a cartoony approach to navigation, which I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sold on, a little too bubbly in my opinion, but I know a lot of people really appreciate the whimsical approach, so to each their own. When looking at a navigation map, you can actually see other Wazers moving around. And more importantly for us, you can see little icons like this exclamation point that signals an issue up ahead, like a vehicle stopped, which was reported three minutes ago. Also, these stacked cars indicate heavy traffic ahead. It's very easy to report your own information for other Wazers by clicking the pin button. There you'll see all the ways that you can report things like traffic cameras, gas prices, an accident, or the police. Now, the trick with Waze in this capacity is using it and still driving safely. It's very important. Waze makes it relatively easy by giving you big buttons to push, but still, be careful. Maybe ask the passenger in your car to do the button pushing for you. Aside from these features, Waze also allows you to send your location to your friends a few different ways. You can share by current location or whatever your navigation destination happens to be, or even your home or office. And your friend can then actually watch you maneuver the hard streets of Petaluma as you make your way. Now, it should be noted that Waze was bought by Google back in 2013. And since then, Google has rolled some of the hazard notifications into Google's own Maps app. So there is some cross-play between the apps. But for the full social experience, you'll have to check out Waze. And you can do so for free. So go get Wazen. All right, before we move on, let's thank the sponsor of today's episode. This episode of Android App Arena is brought to you by lynda.com. lynda.com helps you learn and keep up to date with your software, pick up brand new skills, or explore new hobbies with their easy to follow video tutorials. Whether you want to build your own Android app in Java, learn how to use the Android API to create engaging mobile apps, or just improve your programming language skills. Lynda.com offers thousands of courses on a variety of topics. And you can learn anywhere 
anytime with the lynda.com app for Android. With a lynda.com subscription, members receive unlimited access to the entire course library. Lynda.com works directly with software companies to provide timely training, often the same day new versions or releases hit the market, so you're always up to speed. Learn from top experts, and all of the courses are produced at the highest quality. Not like the homemade videos you'll find on YouTube. Whether you have 15 minutes or 15 hours, you can learn at your own pace, on your own terms. It's only $25 a month for access to the entire Lynda.com course library. Or for $37.50 a month, you can subscribe to the premium plan, which also includes exercise files. And you can try lynda.com right now with a free seven-day trial. Visit lynda.com slash arena to access the entire library. That's over 2,400 courses free for seven days. That's lynda.com slash arena. Okay, so you may remember a few weeks ago I introduced a segment called The Dev 7 name had a nice ring to it so I simply took it and turned it into a seven question segment for developers not really thinking about the fact that seven questions can take a lot of time to answer so today we're gonna chat with another awesome developer in a segment I now call the dev 5 and we'll just keep trimming it back until I hit my target but still hey the dev 5 has a nice ring to it don't you think all right, so uh, today I'm happy to welcome to the show Russell Ivanovich of Shifty Jelly. Uh, welcome to Android App Arena. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, Thanks you, for me. you're my first in-studio guest, so it makes it feel wow. even more official. That That is such an honor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're the developer um, and I imagine co-creator of, of Shifty Jelly. Uh, and, you know, if you are on Android and also on iOS, actually, and watching this show in podcast form, it's very possible that you're watching it on an app called Pocket Cast, which, in my opinion, is is one of the best uh, podcast apps definitely out on Android. I haven't had much experience with uh, podcast apps on iOS, but I imagine it's pretty pretty awesome there, too. Uh, it's definitely my go-to podcast app, and we hear from a lot of fans of, of the Twitch shows that say that they watch our shows through Pocket Cast as well, and you guys are super su successful at kind of bringing design into the approach, and I think that's kind of uh kind of where i want to start right you put you put a high importance on the design the look the feel of the app and it really shows if you had to pick just one quality that's more important than the other what would that be in your in your opinion as a, as a, speaking as a developer would it be the your approach on design or functionality uh, where should indie developers focus their efforts most effectively do you think like initially yeah i understand what you're saying that that is a very good question and i guess this is going to sound a bit airy fairy but we try not to separate design and functionality. Like, they are one and the same. Mm -hmm. Like, design is... I'm not a designer, but design is not just about how something looks. It's how, it, it's how it works. It's the things that it does. Sure. It's how seamless things are together. And, yeah, we, we try and sort of focus on making the basic experience as good as it can possibly be. And then when it comes to sort of adding, you know, extra functionality as well, we tend to try and uh, put that in areas of our app where it's not going to affect... Uh, the usability of it, I guess. So mm -hmm. if there's some really advanced thing that some users want and a lot of them want it, we try and do it in a way that, you know, the advanced users can find it, but, you know, normal people, you know, won't be tripped up by it. Sure. But we always come back to that thing that, yeah, the, the basics of it is is the design and the functionality. They're just one and the same, really. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I, th I think it, that's that's a really important uh, distinction to be made that uh, good design and good functionality really do play hand in hand and if you don't have one but you have the other it's kind of an incomplete package yeah um and i feel like even even at the core of android like we were talking just a little bit earlier like that's kind of what android you know suffered from a couple of years ago exactly right it had great functionality its design wasn't so great and when you don't have those two in marriage lockstep uh you don't necessarily have a, a complete product so yeah definitely definitely uh now cloud sync uh, of course cloud is all the rage these days uh you've now had it in your app i think a little more than a year kind of your sync ability and it's one thing that's really made pocket cast super useful for me uh currently you're, you're doing it through your own system as opposed to using something like a google plus sign-in um is there a downside would you say to using google plus sign-in for something like that or what 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 is behind your decision to do it on your own? Yeah, so I think we've had that for about two years now. And okay. Yeah, originally, I mean, you, it came out two years ago. We didn't start sort of making it two sure. years ago. So the original decision is mainly down to the fact that, you know, possibly three years ago when we started, 
there was no unified Google Plus sign-in. And mm -hmm. Google does have some sort of frameworks where you can save data to the cloud and then you can move it to other devices. But we really felt like we needed to build something that was one cross-platform mm -hmm. because we want to be on iOS, we want to be on true. Android. But one day maybe we want to be on, you know, desktops, the web, maybe we want to be on your watch, in your car, like who knows? Windows we want to be Windows Phone. <laughs> it's a possibility. <laughs> and so we, we looked at the... The solutions. I, I guess one thing we probably maybe should have done at the start is pick a um, a common way of logging in. So we looked at Twitter, we looked at Facebook, we looked at a few other things, but I don't really, sorry if anyone works at Facebook, but I don't trust Facebook that much. And, and Twitter's, you know, they're a bit better, but I still, I don't want to hand all our user data to them. And we don't do anything sort of nefarious with it. You know, we just encrypt it and we store it in a database. There's nothing sort of mm -hmm. special about it. We don't sort of mine the data, we don't sell the sure. data, but it's nice to have control of the system. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's really nice if someone could do the thing end to end. You know, if there was a solution for that and it was amazing, we'd we'd jump on board. But we kind of looked at it and we thought, mm, for all the things that that we need to do, we probably need to build it ourselves. You know, so yeah. we have control. We can get it to work the way we want it to work, and we can sort of add to it over time. It's an interesting conundrum in the sense that you know, often I think more and more these days. Uh, cross-platform development is pretty darn important, right? Like, I, I guess it was always important, but for the longest time it was, you know, in people's minds that developing for iOS and only iOS is good. Now Android's numbers are so powerful and dominant that it's kind of, you know, a no-brainer that eventually at least, if not immediately, yeah. uh, you you develop for both sides. But if you're using a service like Google Plus to do your sign-on, uh, that definitely limits you. Yeah. At, at least for the cross-platform. Yeah, Apple. exactly. And I mean, Apple has, you know, their iCloud and everything else. And that, sure. We don't use that either for, right. the, for the same reasons. Cool. Now, um, last year, I believe it was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you chose to release the, uh, well, the huge Pocket Cast 4 update, uh, Android first. Yeah. And uh, being cross-platform, that, that was kind of a big deal. You know, th that was a year ago and we were hearing a lot less of, you know, Android first then than we are now. Thankfully, we're hearing a little bit more of it now. Uh, you stated in a blog post on the Shifty Jelly site that currently it's easier for a good app to stand out above the rest on Android than it is on iOS, and undoubtedly, lots of has changed in that year. Would you say that's still the case? Uh, I think the gap is definitely closing. So mm -hmm. when we originally looked at it, we looked at the Android platform, and we we really love the Android platform. Like we. I think it gets a really bad rap in the Apple community. You know, that, that's yep. I'm something I'm not a fan of, you know, reading my Twitter stream and seeing people say all these sort of negative things. It's it's a good platform and your users choose, you know, one or the other and that's kind of up to them. But, yeah, I think a lot has changed in a year. But I think the in terms of quality apps, there's still a slight uh, sort of advantage on iOS in terms of numbers mm -hmm. and also in terms of how long some of these developers have been around and, you know, how much they can spend on marketing and how well known they are. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, some of these developers in the iOS community, they go back, you know, 10, 15 years into the Mac sort of OS 10 days and they've got, you know, these followings and they're, they're well known and they build really high quality apps just because they've been doing it for that long. So long. Whereas the Android community is, is a bit newer. You know, there was nothing really before Android that developers could jump in from that was, that was similar. Mm -hmm. Sort of had a design background that, you know, was all about designing products rather than sort of services. And, and that's why Android, has, I think, has taken some time to catch up. But to answer your actual question, I should probably do that. Is um, yeah, I think I think it's getting closer. It is getting a little bit harder to stand out on Android, but I still think it's the case that if you do a really really good job on Android, and if you manage to get noticed, you'd probably be more successful there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, in the short term anyway. I mean, yeah. that could change in a year. Like, well, you know, at the rate that everything is changing, it absolutely could change. Yeah, in a year. Exactly. you just never know. Uh, you've also stated in another blog post that the Android version of Pocket Cast was actually easier to develop than iOS than its iOS counterpart, which I feel like is a opposite opinion than <laughs> a lot of what I hear from developers uh, who developed for both sides, but that testing and support costs were higher on Android, which kind of makes a little sense. Is that last part a, a big hindrance uh, for indie developers? What do you, what can you recommend to those uh, indie developers that can help ease their pain? It, it is getting better. So when yeah. we first made Pocket Cast, you know, we supported, I think, back to Android 2.2. And what we had back then is a lot of manufacturers would ship their own custom native libraries, especially to do with audio and video playback. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a nightmare because there's only so many devices you can buy as an independent developer. You can't buy, you know, thousands of, of Android phones and tablets. And so you have to pick the most popular ones. Mm -hmm. And what inevitably happens is you release your application and then people start reporting things to you. You know, you know this doesn't work, this doesn't work. Right. And then you have to try and go backwards and forwards. So that's where the support overhead comes in. So I, I guess, you know, how do you deal with that? You you just keep building up more and more devices. And 
luckily, as Android has gone forward, Google has started to standardize a lot of that stuff as well. And Google, I'm, I'm failing to remember the name of it, but from uh, the keynote at Google I.O. a couple of days ago, they announced kind of a uh, implementation of a service or a company that really manages a lot of this device testing. Do you remember the name of that? It, I, I can't remember the name um, of it, but, of my it head, no. but it is indicative of what Google is is trying to do and what they need to do after years of people throwing around the uh, the big <laughs> F word, the the other F word, fragmentation, <laughs> um, about you know about developing for Android and what what a big challenge it can be across. Yeah, all I haven't had a chance to dig into that a lot, but it, it it could potentially make a difference. I think the other thing that's important is beta testing. So we. Uh, we run a program just through the Google Play Store with beta testers. Mm -hmm. And so when we have, you know, a brand new feature that we're introducing or we're going to tweak a lot of the underlying sort of things that we do every now and again, we tend to push that out to those beta testers first. And if those, you know, 50 or 60 people report a lot of issues, we can fix that. And once we see them stop reporting issues, mm -hmm. that's when we push it out to the store. And it, inevitably there, there are still things afterwards, but, along the way, but. but you've ironed out all the, the major stuff. You know, For hopefully sure. there's never the case that someone wakes up in the morning their phone is auto-updated and suddenly they can't get their podcast. Right, right. Uh, and finally, normally what I would ask is the last question is kind of like what big things do you have in the works? But I think uh, anyone who watched the keynote, uh, the Google I.O. keynote, probably knows what you're, at least what one of the things that you're working on right now, which is that you were announced as a launch partner for Android Auto, which is kind of Android's new automotive uh, play going forward, getting Android into the car, working with head units, and really making it an eyes-free, uh, voice-activated approach in the car, which I think is incredibly important. Um, explain a little bit about the process of including Android Auto uh, support and basically what other developers can kind of look forward to in, in possibly porting their apps over to the auto service. Yeah, so the good thing about Android Auto is that um, it's a standard interface to all developers. So if you make an app that plays uh, audio, it's there's not a lot of work involved to um, get it in the car. So I think initially we probably spent about a week sort of adding a few extra bits to our app and conforming to an interface that they they give us. Mm -hmm. And then just after that, you know, you get your interface kind of projected into the car and you can see, you know, the artwork and you can see, you know, Jason all about... All about Android. That's the wrong show. All, all about Android App Arena. Is, you, know, this, you could just <laughs> marry the two and it's like yeah, a quadruple A or something. But. So it is it, there. There's not. There's honestly not a lot of work involved. And Google actually controls the entire interface. Yeah. So you get to say, hey, my app is red and, you know, I want these sort of colors and these are some of my buttons and this is what my app can do. But they lay out the entire thing. So there's almost no... Wow, that's no, a difference. Yeah, that's a change right And there. I think in the car that's really important. Mm -hmm. And as a developer and not a designer, that's that's really cool. I don't have to lay anything out. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> so that that's a big time saver as well. And I think that's good for users because all of the apps will look the same. So when you're in the car and you're trying to you know drive along, the buttons will always be in the same place. The and that's an really audio important. app will look like an audio app will look like an audio app. There'll still be a little bit of customization, so we can set some of the the highlight colors and our own sort of artwork and things like that. But mm -hmm. yeah, at least there'll be a consistency there. So that's had, pretty good. had to be cool as indie developers to hear from Google and, and, and have them say, <laughs> hey, we want you to do this super secret thing that nobody's heard about yet. Yeah, that, that was absolutely, you know, blew our minds. And I, I think the funny thing about it is they were they were asking us almost tentatively, like, oh, you know, if you're not too busy and you're not... I'm like, it's Google. Like, Are you kidding me? <laughs> you're the mothership, of course. But we had to pretend to be yeah, like that's a right. bit, you yeah, know, so peel like, it back a little bit. You know, the girl calls Actually. you on the phone. You don't want to be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, yeah <laughs> you know, if we find the time, then... I'm uh, cool. We'll see what we can do. But, yeah, that was an amazing experience. And then we didn't actually know whether we were going to make the keynote or be installed on, on any of the cars. Mm -hmm. So we were sitting there, like, on the edge of our seats oh, just waiting for the moment. And you could see there was a car on the stage from from the start. And we're like, oh, there's a car, you know. Is, are they going to say anything? Going to say? And then our logo comes up in the slide. And I'm like, yeah. Awesome. It was awesome. And we got to sit in one of the, the Audis upstairs and sort of play with our app. And yeah, it's amazing to see something you work on actually, you know, appear on a, a I can physical only thing. Yeah, it's cool. That's great. Well, Russell Ivanovich, uh, it's just awesome having you on the show. I'm really happy that you could a be on the show and b come up from uh, from San Francisco for the uh, part of the afternoon and join me on my new show, Android App Arena. Thank you for doing this. Oh, it was my pleasure. Uh, where can people kind of follow your work, both individually as well as uh, find Pocket Casts and all that other stuff? Yeah, so you'll find all the apps that we make at shiftyjelly.com, just all one word. And if you really want to hassle me personally, Rusty Shelf on Twitter. What's Hot to Trot this week is a fun little action game by Gameloft that caught my eye. In fact, Hot to Trot is quite appropriate because this game is all about jousting. 
It's called Rival Nights, and it's pretty easy to pick up and enjoy in little spurts or spend an entire afternoon jousting your brains out in hot pursuit of power-ups, gold, and the sweet taste of victory. The game mechanics are easy to understand after a few rounds with a focus on arcade-style timing. Your trusty steed approaches the line as you prepare your fingers for what comes next. First, there's a countdown that acts as a special speed boost right off the top if you can tap at the same time the game says go. Then you tap with every speed meter refresh, trying each time to hit a small green target. The closer you are to that target, the faster your steed gallops. And finally, you're given a tiny target on your opponent, onto which you must direct your lance for maximum impact. With each round, I found myself with the same amount of anticipation and nervousness because missing any one element could throw you out of play like a ragdoll. Playing the single player mode is where you'll build your confidence and it's your standard level based gameplay pitting you against opponents in both training and battle facilities as you move through the hundreds of stages. Depending on how you do, you'll be rewarded with gold for power ups to your equipment as well as seals that represent your jouster's stamina. Of course, there are in-app purchases if you want to upgrade your equipment or top off your seals with real money, but as far as I can tell, it's not necessary. You can upgrade your gear through normal, if not somewhat repetitive gameplay over time. There's also a tournament mode that connects you with others online to challenge real people to asynchronous duels that can reward you with premium payouts for upgrades if you finish within the top two spots. But, and this can be a big one, this comes at a cost. The game will not work if you're offline, which is unfortunate. No playing this game on the airplane unless you pony up for the airplane Wi-Fi. Don't like that much, especially considering there's such a substantial single-player mode that takes a lot of time to pursue. However, on the flip side, the gameplay is addictive, the graphics and animations are super engaging, especially when you knock your opponent off his horse. And for free, it ain't half bad at all. Look for Rival Knights by Gameloft now in the Play Store. Okie dokie, well that about does it for this episode of Android App Arena. This show is meant to be a resource for you and also a platform for you to have your voice heard. And I've heard from quite a lot of you already with your favorite apps and ideas for the show. Feed me your ideas, I'm hungry. Email your favorite app picks, categories, whatever, to arena at twit.tv. There's a subreddit at androidapparena.reddit.com where I post categories from time to time and ask that you add your favorite apps from those categories or vote up ones you see posted there already. It really helps me to know which apps in a particular category should be featured on the show. There's a Google Plus community that's easy to find by searching for Android App Arena. Of course, you can always download and subscribe to the show by visiting the site at twit.tv slash arena with new episodes appearing every Friday evening. And I also host a live viewing party of each week's episode on Fridays at 1 p.m. Pacific at live.twit.tv. I'll be on set to talk about the week's featured apps. If I happen to be interviewing a developer for that episode, it'll happen right before your very eyes like magic. All right, that's it, folks. Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Jason Howell, and I'll see you next week in the arena.